Hey everyone, good evening. Thanks for uh, thanks for joining us for our our next uh, our, our our next speaker series. We've got uh, Kurt Wagner from the uh, the uh, Ohio Department of Natural Resources um, to speak to us tonight. Uh, as with the usual formalities here, um, <clears throat> if you have questions, feel free to post them into the chat box, and I will kind of get them off to, to Kurt, you know, as, as his presentation allows. Uh, also, you know, Kurt, Kurt has said he's got no problem if you, if you want to unmute and, uh, and ask your question directly to him. So uh, otherwise, though, we do ask you to keep your, uh, your, your, your microphone on mute, just so that we don't have, uh, um, you know, anyone stealing the show from, uh, from, from Kurt as we go through. Uh, with that, I'm going to hand it off to Kendrick Chittick, Chittick the, uh, the president of the Trout Club, to kind of give us a bit of an introduction here. Great. Thank you, Bob. And uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, the Trout Club is an affiliated society of the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, and we love that relationship. We love that, uh, that support that they give the club um, through that relationship and, and through the mission of the museum really ties in with our work. So although we have social and angling aspects to our club, we like to introduce people uh, to angling and, and to develop that relationship with the outdoors. We also focus on conservation uh, and, and the science side of, of fisheries as well. And so that's why we're really thrilled to have Kurt here tonight. Um, and, and Jerry will be able to tell you a little more about that. Uh, the Trout Club relies on membership. So that's our primary uh, funding source, uh, particularly in years when we don't do the large film festival. Um, we all miss that and we're hoping we can uh, get it back next year for you. Um, so before we get going here, I want to remind you guys also that we have a fantastic event coming up on Saturday uh, called the Fly Fair out at Helen Hazen Wyman Park. Uh, we're going to be over there uh, most of the day and uh, we will be auctioning off uh, old gear, uh, some gear that's just been sitting in closets. Uh, and we're kind of going to use that to, uh, to some of these conservation programs that we work on. So please... Uh, stop by and, and see us then. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Jerry now to introduce our speaker. Thanks, y'all. Uh, thanks, Kendrick. Thanks, Bob. Uh, Kurt, uh, thank you for taking your time tonight uh, to join us uh, and really looking forward to, to this uh, presentation. Uh, I know this whole thing's kind of been in the works for a number of months trying to get everybody's schedules coordinated in everything. Uh, and uh, again, I'm glad we're able to get this, uh, get this finalized and, and looking forward to uh, seeing the status of uh, what the brook trout is in Ohio. And, uh, you know, hopefully there's a way that, you know, the museum trout club might be able to help you out in some manner. Uh, so, uh, Kendrick mentioned the fly fair. Uh, I've been working a lot the last couple of weeks getting things together for that. And it really won't be an auction as much as it's pre-owned uh, equipment. Some of it's totally brand new, you know, some of it's used and gently used, but it, it's kind of all priced uh, and everything. And we'll have it out uh, for you to come look at. And it covers pretty much a complete range of, uh, fly fishing gear and we even have a 17 foot uh, square stern canoe that made it in into the uh, mix uh, courtesy of Ken Butel. So anyhow, Kurt, I'll let you get rolling. And again, we appreciate it. Uh, we appreciate everybody sitting in and hope we get a chance to see you on Saturday. Thank you. All right. Well, can you guys hear me all right? Yep, no yep. problem here. Fantastic. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I was kind of joking before uh, the, the thing began tonight that the last time I was with your club was probably five, six years ago and in the rare book room with the clam bake. So uh, a little different ambiance tonight, um, but nonetheless, happy to see everybody. And, um, you know, hopefully we can have sort of an engaging, uh, engaging dialogue and you know, any follow up questions, certainly uh, if you're watching this after the fact, uh, hit me up. I'll have my contact information at the end. Um, so, yeah, like folks said, I, I'm Kurt Wagner. So with the Division of Wildlife, ODNR Division of Wildlife, the Fisheries Management Supervisor for District 3, Northeast Ohio. Um, 
So I oversee a staff of biologists and technicians who manage fishing accesses, uh, help structure stockings, do fish population assessments. Most of our work is sport fish related. However, uh, you know, as able, we do um, bound off in the direction of species of conservation need as well. And I'll sort of touch on all of those concepts here in a minute. Um, this evening, I want to talk about a few things. I want to talk um, a little bit about just the Division of Wildlife, what it is, what we do. Um, a lot of folks are asking, you know, how has, uh, how has COVID affected fishing? So uh, I'll touch on that a little bit. Um, and then, of course, the, the meat of this, getting into the native brook trout discussion and, and conservation and the history of that species and have some question and answers we go. So um, just first a little bit about the Division of Wildlife, um, probably preaching to the choir for the most part, but um, just kind of who we are, you know, we are one of the divisions within the broader ODNR. A lot of people think of us interchangeably, um, but there is many divisions within ODNR. Um, you know, some sort of high profile, like the Division of Wildlife or Parks, you know, you, you see a game warden, you go to a state park and, and others dealing with mineral resources and water resources. Um, and the mission with, of the Division of Wildlife is to conserve and improve fish and wildlife resources and their habitats for sustainable use and appreciation by all. Um, so there's a lot in here. I mean, obviously mission statements kind of become, you know, flippant and you say them quickly and don't think about it, but, you know, we have conservation in here we have resources and habitats. We have the word all, not just sportsmen. Um, so, you know, I'll talk a little bit here in a minute about our funding and, and where it's been, where it might be going. And, you know, folks oftentimes do think of us as sort of the hook and bullet entity with the hunting and the fishing licenses and all that. Um, but our mission is conservation of all wildlife resources. And we take that seriously. And I, I think there's some interesting funding even on the horizon to, uh, direct efforts even more so across the board of species beyond uh, your traditional harvestable critters. So I said I was the fish management supervisor for District 3. Uh, this map shows we cover 19 Northeast counties. Our office is in Akron on the Portage Lakes. Um, we work very you know, collaboratively with the other district uh, fisheries groups and with our research groups to you know, to what we do on the ground is a very coordinated and strategic effort. Um, but, but uh, on the, you know, on the water, my staff covers these, these Northeast counties. And there's just uh, the contact information for our office. I'll put my email address up here at the end. So uh, I just wanted to touch on funding. This is, I don't want to get into this too deep. There's no reason to, but I think it is interesting. It tells it a little bit of a story. Um, this figure is a couple of years old, so don't get, you know, caught up in the exact dollar amount. But this is essentially, you know, a revenue chart for the Division of Wildlife. And I just wanted to point out where we stand right now. Um, the major funding of wildlife conservation in Ohio, and really this chart could look the same if you were in Nebraska or Iowa. It's the same model, you know, nationally, really. But a large chunk of wildlife conservation funding comes from, not surprising, the sale of, those, of fishing and hunting licenses and the associated permits. So that right side of the pie graph, you know, 50% there are what you traditionally think of as your licenses and tags. Um, the gray wedge that represents about a third of this pie chart, the, the second yellow circle I have, um, that's a federal reimbursement program. It's the uh, Federal Aid and Sport Fish Restoration Act. Um, it's Pittman Robertson on the wildlife side. So when you buy binoculars and tackle and ammunition, all of, there's an excise tax on all of that that goes to the Fish and Wildlife Service federally and gets apportioned out to the states on a match basis. So we use the money that comes in from license sales to capture our match on the, the federal aid side. And so you can see that, you know, a large part of the funding block is sportsmen, sportswomen funded, um, with really just about a, a quarter or less of that pie coming from sort of the other miscellaneous sources. So I did want to point that out. It's important for, for anglers and hunters and trappers to realize they are, you know, the machine funding conservation. Uh, the landscape might be changing a little bit. Um, there's some sort of exciting initiatives on the, on the horizon that might come for, you know, uh, funding that partners for some of the non-game species. I mentioned that in our mission statement that our, our charge is all species. And we're also seeing with this administration in Ohio, 
um, some great support out of out of the general revenue side of things for some of our infrastructural improvements and, and big dam improvement projects. So ODNR is seeing a lot of support from the uh, the wine administration, and so I don't want to leave that out either. Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out, and it's in this red elongated oval, um, about one percent of our revenue comes in the form of the various mechanisms that are considered wildlife diversity and endangered species. So, you know, the the various uh, license plate checkoffs or some of those other ways that, um, you know, wildlife diversity gets funded is a very small percentage right now. And so, I, you know, I say that as we transition into brook trout here in a minute, um, that that would be the wedge of the pie that goes into things that aren't, you know, caught or shot. And so you can see that, you know, our revenue and, and hence our, our work allocation is heavily on the consumptive side. Um, there's some things that may change that. And one of the things that I just wanted to mention, um, you know, I think if you're a conservationist or an outdoors person, you probably want to keep your eye on this. Um, it's Recovering America's Wildlife Act. We call it RAWA. Um, but this is essentially right now, it's, it's a federal legislation that's working through um, committees and whatnot. And to essentially amend the existing Pittman-Robertson Act which was that 1950s act that, that puts money back to the state from the federal side. And this would broaden this out um, and provide a, a sizable amount of matchable money to state agencies, specifically for species and habitats of, of conservation need and conservation concern. So um, there may be sort of a little bit of a paradigm shift with, with state wildlife agencies around the country um, with a lot more fund funding coming in on the non-game side to sort of pair up with the game side of what we do. Um, so we're kind of interested and in anxiously watching this as it may sort of broaden our abilities to, to do various tasks. So something to keep an eye on. So I just wanted to you know point that out, a little bit of update on funding. Um, I think we're definitely seeing a time of change nationally in how conservation will be funded. So that's interesting. I want to touch on COVID a little bit. So. I'm sure you have on your own streams that you fish or lakes, you've seen the, the increase in boating, boating traffic and kayaking traffic and angling. Um, and, you know, is it just the same sportsmen that are always been there that are just now outside more often, or is it new people into the fold, so to speak? Um, so just a little bit about uh, our kind of license sales and what that looks like in relation to 2020 and, and moving into 2021 here. And I'll shout out to Andy Burt. He's our, our staff person in Columbus who put some of these figures together. Um, if you have been up in the Northeast Ohio area long enough, engaged with a trout club, you may recognize his name because he actually worked on the brook trout 12 to 15 years ago or so within the uh, Division of Wildlife. So, you know, last year, I, obviously I'm not going to go into it, everybody's lived through it, but you know, from our perspective within the agency. So, you know, March 13th was when there was restrictions on gatherings out of the governor's office. And then, um, you know, quickly following that, April 7th is when we paused our non-resident license sales. So in that March to April phase, you know, a lot of folks who could started working from home and all this and that restrictions and, you know, don't go out unless you have to. And then that's when the out-of-state travel stuff started to come into play, which really sort of tipped our, you know, side of things to where, we needed to stop selling the non-resident licenses to be you know, in line and supportive of what the governor's office was trying to do. And, and those non-resident licenses um, are a big, you know, a notable part of our annual revenue. So, you know, it wasn't taken lightly that we had to do it, but obviously it was the right thing to do. And so you wonder how does that affect things like fishing on the walleye run? And then of course, if we get into birding and hunting as well, it had ramifications for, for that as well. Um, but on the flip side, you know, everybody sort of knew that people had more time, whether they wanted to have more time or not. And that fishing and hunting allowed for social distancing. Um, you know, one of the things that was constantly on the news cycle was get outside for your mental health, be active, just social distance. So, I mean, that is fishing. So what do we see? Um, you know, one interesting thing was just before that, you know, working through the 2019 legislative process, um, our own Ohio House bill, 166 that was a fee increase. It was the first uh, fishing license fee increase we saw in at least a decade. I forget what the, the, the number is there of how many years, but 
it was a long time coming that, that a fishing license increase needed to happen for sort of fiscal solvency. And it happened to be that 2019 legislative cycle to go into effect in 2020. And, you know, a resident adult fishing license went from $19 to 25. Um, doesn't seem like a huge jump, I would say, to most folks in their annual budget, in their household. But still, we pretty much know that we see about a 5% decrease in license sales anytime you institute a license increase. And so going into 2020 with COVID, we're like, well, here comes our license increase as well. However, we saw license sales increase in, in every category of license that we sold. Um, our license anglers in 2020 increased 8%. And so, you know, mind you, I said we expected a 5% decrease from because of the license cost that we were, you know, raising there. And so not only do we not see that 5% decrease, we saw the 8% increase. So we got up to, you know, over 900,000 anglers. This was the highest number we've seen since 2003, um, you know, a big walleye year in Lake Erie. Um, so definitely the amount of anglers you're seeing out there wasn't just uh, the same anglers who had more time, it was indeed new people as well. Um, it translated into about a $5 million increase on wildlife revenue from the fishing side of things. Uh, we had just instituted our multi-year fishing license. So th this 300% increase is a little bit skewed because it's kind of new. So of course you're going to get a high percentage increase from the year prior. Um, but we saw, you know, a lot of people jumping on top of that three-year license increase that had a little bit of cost savings too that sort of offset the, the one-year uh, rate hike. And despite the non-resident sales that, that we had to stop for a while in April, once we were able to open those non-resident license sales back up, on the year as a whole, we saw an increase in 9% in our non-resident fishing license sales. Um, it was interesting though, those are the full year round licenses, the one day and three days decrease. So you can imagine the, the every now and then travelers weren't showing up with you know, the way travel restrictions were, but our regular you know, Lake Erie fishing neighbors to the east and west out of state still bought their license and we saw an increase in 9% there. So a lot of people getting out and fishing in 2020. Um, the, this is interesting. This kind of shows week of the year. Uh, the 14th week represents mid-April on most years, including 2019. So 2019 is that gray figure. In most years, somewhere in mid-April on a weekend when we have the first sort of spike of nice weather is when we usually see the, the the peak of our fishing license sales. Now you look at 2020, you know, we were still in a lot of uncertainty in mid-April. Um, and so our, our sales were down year to date at that point. But then you zoom out to week 24 or 22, I should say, I guess, that represents Memorial Day, the end of May. And, you know, you have still a lot of quarantine going on. You have a little less uncertainty on what COVID means for everybody's daily lives. You have nice weather and time on your hands and lack of summer vacations and the license sales just shot through the roof and with our you know spike being higher than typical and later so it was very interesting sort of what what covid you know did to these timings um another thing to layer on this that is interesting we're kind of sitting here in 2021 saying okay are we going to retain those anglers what does this look like we don't really know yet because we also um, recently instituted that your fishing license is good for a year after the date of purchase. So with that peak coming around Memorial Day of last year, we're still right now a couple weeks away from that huge sort of burst of licenses starting to expire. And then we'll be able to get a better read on, are we retaining those new license buyers that came into the fall last year? Or is normal life and activities going to sort of push them back and fishing was just a substitute. So that's that's going to be very interesting for us to see. Um, you know, speaking of retaining customers, you know, we, we've done some other things. So we have multi-year fishing license, the three, the five, even the 10-year license. We allowed for folks to select automatic renewals. You know, you put your card in the system just like any other subscription and you can renew automatically if you choose. You know, some strategies that businesses do on the routine to, to keep customer retention. Uh, we're trying to, you know, starting looking at things that way. Another thing is, you know, we have to definitely capitalize on mobile trends in, in, in the world of online. You know, a lot fewer people are going into the mom and pop store to buy their fishing license. Um, we're seeing upwards of 25% of the fishing licenses now being bought online. 
And in August of last year, we un unveiled the Hunt Fish Ohio app. So it's a free app. If you don't have it, go to the iStore or Google Play and look for Division of Wildlife Hunt Fish. The app, download that app. It's great. It, you can buy your license online. It stores it on the app even when you're not on mobile data. And so you can pull it up to show an officer, for example, in the field. Um, you can check in game from the app. You can see regulations. Uh, we're going to constantly keep pushing more tools onto that app and capitalize on, you know, the benefits of mobile technology. So, you know, that we saw a lot of licenses being purchased on that app at the second half of last year. So that's some of the directions we're moving to be accessible. And so then really, you know, how do we capitalize then on 2020 success, if we want to call that from a license sales standpoint and retain these high levels of participation, you know, so we have to remain relevant and, and, and reach anglers where they're at, provide them, you know, the resources they need to stay engaged um, so that, you know, Little League and everything else doesn't just immediately replace back into the, you know, back into, you know, replace what fishing did last year, that we are actually retaining anglers and, and hunters. So um, we have a marketing group and, and whatnot that are working on sort of how that can happen. So that's just a little bit about COVID and kind of license sales and some of that. I know that, that seems to be an interesting topic. I get asked about quite, quite often here as of late. So before we jump into the brook trout, let me sort of turn back on my, my picture of other people. Are there any questions that have come up in the chat or anything on that sort of broader wildlife funding COVID type stuff before we jump into brook trout? Nothing in the chat yet, Kurt. Uh, anyone on the call, if you have some questions, feel free to uh, unmute and, and jump in here. Hey, Kurt, uh, this is Jerry. Uh, you know, this, with the permits and everything that are required, you know, for various types of hunting and that, and, you know, you probably get this asked all the time, uh, but how come we've never really enacted any type of a cold water conservation stamp or permit, especially based on, you know, the cost of the steelhead program and the various trout programs that we have going on around the state? Yeah, no, it's a great question, um, and, and I have an answer. We'll see if it's a satisfying one, but, you know, obviously we're well aware of those stamps and states that do them, um, not something that we haven't considered and, and, you know, discussed over the years. What it really comes down to is, like any business, it's just going to be sort of how do you, how do you budget and direct funds? So what those stamps do, and of course it's the added layer of government, it's not just business, you have to enact these things and then there's you know, actual law that protects those funds from other uses. And, and what you end up having is creating a whole bunch of silos all with less money in them than your big silo. And what we try to do is manage across all recreational users in a way where we can, you know, our goal was to meet everybody's needs and desires without having all these silos that you can't be flexible and re sort of reactive to use, if that makes sense. So we, you know, internally, we, we have a sort of a painstaking planning process across, you know, wildlife and fisheries. And then within fisheries, these projects and that projects and how do we allocate hatchery resources and this and that. So, I mean, it's a very, you know, thought out, planned, written. We have a you know, document we submit to the Fish and Wildlife Service for review each year that goes through our, our programmatic approach and where we're going to spend money on different tasks. That's part of that federal capture. We have to do that. And so the same would come up. So the muskie folks would say, hey, our muskies cost $20 a piece to raise. We want to protect that fishery. We need a muskie stamp because we don't want that fishery going away. And so then now we have a musky silo and then we have a cold water silo or a steelhead silo of money. And the pheasant hunters say, well, we need a pheasant stamp so that we can make sure we have the pheasant program. The next thing you know, almost every activity that we're trying to provide holistically for sportsmen and sportswomen all have their own silos and you're sort of losing the, the power to be reactive when, hey, we need to do a big improvement over here for steelhead rearing. We just have the ability to do that and we can still keep pheasants going. We're not limited to this little silo of steelhead money that isn't gonna be able to do that bigger repair or that bigger you know, initiative we need to do. Um, so I guess that's the, I hope I explained that clearly. I mean, that's, 
the nuts and bolts of it is allowing for flexibility and being responsive to sort of hear if we're satisfying our sportsmen with what they want. Um, you know, is there a need for, is there always a need for more public access for Steelhead, for example? Yes, of course there is. Um, you know, we partner a lot with Metro Parks and various entities to try to, you know, keep working together to piecemeal access. Um, I suspect that's probably where the, the notion of a stamp is coming from, is from access. I know some states use it for that. Um, you know, from the management and rearing standpoint, hopefully we've sort of shown what I'm saying is true in the priority that, you know, we've given with the Castalia renovation and, you know, the, the, the huge infrastructural investment we made there for, for steelhead rearing. I mean, the program is definitely not going anywhere. And does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, more or less. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Hey, Kurt, before we move on, we did get another uh, kind of similar, you know, question or, or perhaps comment from within the chat. Uh, someone commenting, you know, in, in Pennsylvania, for an extra five bucks, you can get a button with your uh, uh, license on it. Is is that another? Is that anything that you know Ohio has considered, or uh, you know other kind of <laughs> perhaps smaller sources of revenue from the same from the same uh, uh, you know pool? Okay, I got you. So almost not to use this word in negatively, but almost sort of a, a gimmicky thing that somebody can do to kind of adds a little bit of extra money into the pot and it's kind of unique. Is that kind of maybe where- Yeah, exactly. Around? Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. that's the question, yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I, guess I, I guess my answer is I don't know. I mean, we like I said, we are kind of building up our marketing staff now as we kind of realize yeah. that's, a, that's a part of this. And so will some of those type of things come come out? Possibly. I mean, I know, you know, the button specifically with them having to display their license kind of takes on a different, you know, Aspect well, there, as, a, as a holder of both licenses mm -hmm. and that stupid button, <laughs> that button is not a substitute for your license. You know, oh, technically, okay. you still have to display your license. It's not your license. It just is a button that says you bought a license. And, I got you. Okay. And it expires. It's nice, but I won't get another one. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but if you sold me so a there's... button instead of my license and you gave me an electronic copy... I might pay more for the button and the electronic copy if you're looking to upcharge me. I got you. Well, no, that's, I mean, that's interesting feedback. I, I, I can, I can say that in my role, I am not thinking often about the sort of cool other things that could add revenue, but uh, I, I'll have to mention to our folks that the, the Pennsylvania button thing, now that we have the app that you know, legally shows licenses on your phone. Um, no, it's interesting. I, I hadn't heard the Pennsylvania button. So, and I'm from Pennsylvania. I guess that shows how long it's been since I went back to fish myself. So, and just to jump in, whoever it was who said they won't buy another button, I, I'd like to talk to you in a year because I've got I've said the same thing every year, and I've got a dozen buttons sitting on my on my desk right now. So, <laughs> so. <laughs> it, it, it's Compton. I tend to buy my licenses in three year stretches, but you have to buy the button every year. So yeah. if I don't have to go back, I get you. It, it's complicated. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, it's kind of like not to be on a too much of a tangent and then spend all night, but I mean, it's kind of like our fish Ohio pins, right? I mean, they don't really like mean anything per se, but folks really get a charge out of like challenging themselves to get a fish Ohio, you know, fish and then get the button. Um, you know, so if there's things like that, that has just a slight price tag to it in concept, you know, I think it, it's a way to keep people kind of engaged, I guess, and show they support something. So yeah, that makes, that's interesting. Awesome. Okay. So oh, I just found the chat window now. So I guess are we caught up on questions? Yeah, we're we're, we're caught yeah. up. Yeah, for, okay. for sure. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Well, uh, how about I move forward on the brook trap? Does that sound good? Yeah, it sounds great. All right. So um oh, lost my there we go. So, you know, I definitely I gave a brook trout spiel back when I, I visited with your club last, but like I said, that was probably 2013, 14, 15. So depending on your membership and whatnot, it may be a fairly new story for, for some. Um, but, you know, just kind of wanted to talk a little bit about the history of Brook Trout in Ohio, kind of where we're at now, moving forward. Um, 
you know, spoiler alert, this isn't one that is like already sitting at a happy ending. We're sort of at a crossroads of, of what we do with these critters. And, you know, I'm sure you guys have had your, your discussions within the club. I mean, I've talked to George Klein pretty often about Brooke Trout, um, Steve Madewell and myself and Terry Harmon actually just recently met um, out of Sulphur Springs uh, to sort of chat Brooke Trout and kind of what the future might look like for, for conservation initiatives. So um, it, it's, it's not a holistic story. There's chapters yet to be written, let's say. Uh, but you guys probably know, so Brook Trout is actually a, a, a char um, in the Salmonid group, along with the true trouts. It's sort of nearest relative. It might be the lake trout from sort of our region of the world. Beautiful fish known for their, for their gorgeous colors. Um, this gets into the range a little bit. And this is in the light brown, I guess. The lighter color would be the native range. And then, of course, you can see in the darker, you know, maroon. They've just been stocked all over the West. It's just funny as, you know, you go to the National Fisheries Conferences and you're sitting in on brook trout talks. You might have just given a talk or heard a talk from West Virginia or something about, you know, conservation and trying to keep these things holding on. Then you sit in a talk where they're desperately trying to get rid of them for, you know, cutthroat or some other native species out West. So it's just funny how one person's conservation effort becomes somebody else's, uh, you know, nuisance. But uh, if we just zoom in here on what's basically considered the, the, the Eastern brook trout kind of up along the, the Appalachia range. If you look at the colors, red is bad and green is good. Um, and you see a lot more red than green. So you, you get up into Maine and get into upper New York and New England, um, you, you know, pink is present, but kind of lacking some quantitative data, so more just qualitative. Green is an actual measured intact good population. Yellow is sort of reduced at risk and then red is greatly reduced. So um, even where I'm from, you know, central Pennsylvania, you grew up thinking brook trout were, you know, kind of everywhere, but, you know, a lot of Pennsylvania is going through the same sort of issues with their native brook trout as we are in our little patch of Ohio. So speaking of Ohio, if you squint towards Cleveland, you can see our tiny little splotch of red that's nearly forgotten. And uh, that is a tiny enclave of native brook trout. Um, you can have a habitat like this that sits 25 miles from downtown Cleveland. And it's just crazy. You know, you come in off this expressway and go through shopping centers and drop down into a valley. And then you see this kind of stuff. It's just gorgeous. Problem is, this kind of habitat is incredibly uh, threatened and sensitive when you're in the middle of urban and suburbia, like we are in, in, in greater Cleveland. Um, but this is the kind of habitat that brook trout need. Um, a little bit about the, the history of brook trout. Um, we can go back to some really early writings that talk about brook trout, you usually say speckled trout or some other flowery language. Um, but definitely leads us to believe that not only were brook trout present in, in, in Ohio or certainly the Western Reserve part of Ohio, but, but even abundant. Um, then, of course, along came European colonization. It's kind of the story for a lot of bad environmental things. Um, the 1800s were pretty much marked by deforestation. And by the late 1800s, over 80% of Ohio's original forests had been timbered. You can imagine that 1880s, forestry industry wasn't following the same BM, the, you know, same best management practices, timbering practices that we ascribe to now. And so, you know, this land clearing, although needed for agriculture and development was just brutal on lots of native species, including the brook trout. Um, we have writings, this is sort of an 1830s writing by uh, Kirtland, one of the sort of early uh, naturalists of Ohio and noted that the speckled trout are to be found in Ohio in only two streams, a small creek in Ashtabula County and a branch of the Chagrin River in Geauga County. So there's, you know, early to mid 1800 writing already talking about their decline. And if we fast forward a little bit more, uh, get into the sort of second half of the 1800s, we have a, a Cleveland medical doctor, Theodatus Garlic, who, um, wrote all kinds of stuff, but uh, he was sort of one of the, the forefathers or the original, you know, folks who got into fish propagation, um, sort of one of the original aquaculturists 
of our era here. And he writes that um, in a few streams in Northeast Ohio, they were found in abundance 30 or 40 years since. And a few are yet to be found on the headwaters of the Chagrin River. But in very short period of time, they must become extinct unless measures are taken for their reproduction. So that's 1857, I believe that was, that there's a call for you know, conservation essentially. Now, I, I sometimes take this a little bit lightly because I, I took the chance to read a, read a lot more into uh, our buddy Garla here, and um, he was very much on the uh, production side of fish rearing, and and he was actually, you know, he was one of the founders of the American Fishery Society, but kind of separated himself from that ten or twelve years in because the American Fishery Society didn't want to get into the business of sort of market price setting. They viewed themselves as more conservation and you know, sort of a professional society. So it was clear that he had a stake in these brook trout from a economic standpoint as well from rearing them. But nonetheless, we'll take him at his word here that he's calling for a conservation of them. So then we zoom 100 years later, uh, we get into the 50s, Milt Troutman, um, you know, the, in my world, one of the famous books on fish, The Fishes of Ohio. So he writes, looking back in time, looking back to the 30s and 40s, he writes, at this time, several tributaries of two branches of the Chagrin River in Geauga County likewise appeared to have contained formerly suitable habitat. By 1945, almost all vestiges of these habitats have been destroyed. So now our mid 1900s accounts aren't really even talking about the fish. They're talking about the habitats the fish would have been in. So from our early fisheries literature, we can see the, the long ago decline and, and presumed extirpation of brook trout in Ohio. Until 1972, Dr. Andy White at John Carroll was doing some work and in some headwater streams and found some brook trout. Um, kind of presumed, from what I hear, uh, that he thought these were probably stocked, even though they were, you know, he was aware they were in the vicinity of historical accounts of native brook trout. And, and as I understand it, you know, he didn't tell everybody and their brother, but figured they were probably stocked, but kind of thought, you know, let's sort of think on this a little bit. And so as genetic work became more accessible to field biology, these trout were looked at genetically. Um, this is a, a excerpt here, some excerpts from a 1998 report. So obviously the work was done before that kind of in the nineties, but looking at the genetics of, of these brook trout up in the, the, you know, sort of greater Chardon area, some of the things from this report said that the Chagrin River populations, and I, when I say that, we mean the Chagrin River drainage, were of Eastern US origin, suggested that these populations are being maintained by wild rather than hatchery fish. So there's a very you know, known set of genetic fingerprints on common hatchery streams of brook trout, and these didn't match any of those. Uh, that the measures of genetic diversity were comparable to the known wild brook trout from the upper Great Lakes, and summarized that these should be considered unique entities for the purpose of conservation of native fish populations. So this is sort of the, the sort of, all right, here we are, you know, conclusion that what we were looking at were, you know, remnant uh, fish from native brook trout, you know, established wild brook trout um, from the glacial recession. So super cool, you know, super small pocket of fish left. And in the same time frame. The Division of Wildlife, along with partners, you know, said, hey, we got to take this seriously and look at a way to do some reintroduction. So I'm going to talk about that reintroduction project. Um, you know, part of that was sort of the forming of what was called the, the Brook Trout Advisory Committee. Nothing really formal. Um, we still kind of have resurrected the Brook Trout Advisory Committee or partnership here in, in recent years to kind of get a focus on these fish again. But you had folks from EPA, uh, Geauga, Met uh, Geauga Park District, Cleveland Metro Parks, Division of Wildlife, University Schools, uh, Fish and Wildlife, you, had, you know, Trout Unlimited. You had folks coming together at the table, you know, what, what are we going to do here about these native fish we just kind of confirmed? And part of that was, let's try to reintroduce them into other similar streams in the area. So this reintroduction project that happened kind of throughout the 90s, in fact, I think I have some date ranges in my notes here somewhere, the exact dates, we'll get to those, but they involve sort of four parts. The first were, were stream surveys, just to look at what would be the candidate streams that you could stock and reintroduce native brook trout into. Um, 
we generally looked only in um, that chagrin drainage. We did look a little bit outside the chagrin drainage, definitely stayed in the Lake Erie drainage. Um, about 200 streams were surveyed and only 15 were actually found to have the conditions that were suspected to sustain naturally reproducing brook trout and things like you know cold spring fed water, the, the appropriate geology, a substrate bottom that was rocky without silt, you know, the riffles, in-stream cover, stable water flow. I mean, it really had to be that sort of spring fed headwater that was stable. So you take 15 candidate streams and you dice it down to 15 that you're, or 200 candidate streams, dice it down to 15 you're gonna try. So then we had to develop, you know, what fish are we gonna stock out? Um, so we ultimately ended up rearing fish, the Castalia State Fish Hatchery. Um, the broodstock were brought in from uh, uh, the, you know, initial stream there um, near Bass Lake where they were found, um, spawned out. Our hatchery folks did a great job of rearing the brook trout. And that's what was used for the subsequent years of, of fish propagation. Um, the brook trout were then stocked as fry about 40 millimeters. So, you know, inch and a half, almost two inches in length annually during April. Um, for the, as a general method, uh, each candidate stream received three consecutive years of these fry stockings to an attempt to establish a, a self reproducing population. About 80,000 fry ultimately were stocked across the, the period of 1996 to 2003 um, into these 15 streams. So this map here shows the locations. Uh, hopefully it shows up well on your monitor, but uh, there's 15 red dots that show the reintroduction streams that were chosen for the project where these fry stockings occurred. For the most part, you're in that chagrin drainage. Um, you have one over here in the Rocky River drainage as well. Um, and the far west one, oh, the Black River drainage, I, that one didn't work. I'm trying to remember which site that, that was called, but yeah, so generally staying in the, in the chagrin and definitely in Lake Erie drainage. And then lastly, the four parts of the project were an evaluation, you know, so did it work? Um, and so most streams were evaluated after the stocking phases were concluded. So sort of that 2003 to 2008-ish range. Uh, brook trout were sampled using same nets in late summer to look at the abundance of both the age zeros to sort of get at if spawning was occurring and then also look at the abundance you know of the adults without necessarily being able to age them um, but the, the presence of the age zero fish would tell us that natural reproduction was occurring so this is that same map now the the, the reintroduction sites are color-coded so it's a little hard to see but the blue triangles are where it was quite successful. Uh, the yellow squares are where we had variable success. So not consistently producing year classes, but some signs of natural reproduction. And then the red were basically where those stockings didn't take and populations weren't reproducing. Um, so, you know, that far west one is red, some uh, up there near the Holden Arboretum are red. And then we have, you know, a bunch of variables kind of in that Western Geauga County area. So moving, and that's kind of where, you know, so the, you know, the stockings happened, the evaluation happened, the report was written up and, you know, that was the reintroduction project. So I, I hired on in 2008, I think they had just that year or so finished up, maybe 2007, finished up writing the report from that reintroduction project. And then we kind of were uh, in a wait and see. Earlier, I mentioned Andy Burt, the guy who actually put together our license numbers for us in those, in those slides. He moved on. He was a biologist up here working on the brook trout. I came in and my supervisor, Phil Hillman, was like, hey, we need to you know, sort of figure out a way to keep track of, of brook trout now that the project is over and still track these things. So starting in 2009, we developed you know, just kind of an occasional monitoring program to, to basically do a status check on the brook trout populations that were either successful or variable. So we do backpack electrofishing. Um, it's an electrofisher unit that's set up precisely for, for small salmonids. It's a, a very gentle pulse on them. Um, we see very, very low mortality and basically no spinal injuries are observed, which can be the case with other electrofishing with salmonids. Uh, we do this in August, September. We try to make sure we definitely get in there before it's going to be sort of spawning time. 
you know, we standardize our approach, uh, you know, how the distances we go in each stream, et cetera, so we can compare year to year, stream to stream, a quick measure of the fish and release them. We, we maybe only go, you know, 20 meters to the end of a little pool, we work up those fish, put them right back where they were and then move on. So we try to have a very light footprint on these populations and only sample them as often as we really need to, to, to see what's going on. Um, this table kind of shows our sampling of the, the streams over the years. And I'll kind of build this for us here. So the, the, the first five streams at the top are those streams that were the, the blue triangles in the map. Those are the streams that left the project successfully creating annual year classes of reproduction. And then the bottom five streams are the ones that left the project in a variable, variable state. Some years they had reproduction, some years they didn't. And that's kind of how we'll organize this table moving forward. And of course, the years across the top are the years of surveying. So for example, at the bottom part of this chart, we see that you know, we went in right away at Mount Glen Farm with electrofishing, saw no trout. Um, if we got in a situation where we were finding no trout, we would then electrofish the entire reach of the stream to really confirm that zero. On, on waters where we know we are seeing trout, we're only doing a subset of the stream anyways to not put undue pressure on the population. And then if you look at the next one up, Pettybone, you can see we went in 2009 and our measure of adult population was low. 2012 qualitatively was low. Of course, we have numbers behind us. I'm just kind of putting it qualitatively here. And then you went in 2015 and we had no fish. And I'll talk about Pettybone here in a minute as a case study, but that's kind of how this table is gonna build. So if we add in the rest of those streams that were in that variable category, we can see that by and large, those streams that left the reintroduction project variable basically just needed time to die out. They were not really destined to, to work. Um, we, we only have one stream remaining in that variable stream category where we still have a, a reasonable population. And even that one is looking not the greatest. This is the Affelter stream. If we look at the streams that left the reintroduction project in what we consider the successful state, there we see, you can still kind of see a downtrend. You got more of the green, which represents the high numbers on the left side of our screen than we do on the right, but we still are having fish at all of these sites. Um, and so, you know, those categorizations meant something coming out of that reintroduction project. The successful really are hanging on more so than the, than the variable streams. And I'm just gonna then take two examples, two little case studies about kind of what we're seeing and why some of these trends are what they are. And then we'll kind of wrap up with what I think this might look like moving forward. So I mentioned Pettybone. I'm gonna highlight that first as a case study. 2009, 2012, low adult populations, 2015, none. So this stream is in the Chagrin River watershed. Um, it's actually on private property, the Pet, you know, Pettybone family. Uh, great family, very aware of the cool resource they had on their property. Um, it was a pleasure to be there each time we went to look at the fish. Um, small spring-fed stream, mostly forested watershed. There were two small upstream ponds, but the, the water as a whole maintained a cold temperature. So um, it's, it was, seemed like a pretty good spot. So in 2009 and 2012, I'm going to sort of put up a few figures that, that look like this. Um, the, the maroon dots represent adult fish and the green dots represent age zero or you know, that year class of young fish. And, and you don't need to get too worked up in what the axis on the left is. Just suffice it to say it's, it's our measure of abundance, a standardized measure of abundance of fish. So you can see that from 2009 to 2012, you know, the young fish, the year class measure went down a little bit. The adult abundance went down a little bit, but not notably, they're, they're still there. And during this survey period, you know, the stream looked like this, uh, clear water. You can see that substrate that's exposed, the gravels and the pebbles, uh, undercut bank, intact stream banks. You know, that was what it looked like. When we went back in 2015, this is what we went back to see. This was a picture we took that day. Um, so we had that township had 200 year storms within a week in 2015, extremely localized flooding and heavy rain and the landscape just couldn't buffer it. And the stream became a gully, just complete scouring. Um, the substrate that you saw in that prior picture was gone. 
and you know cut banks you can see where the water was up on the different sides um just completely changed the nature of that stream and and we saw no trout nor other fish as well which usually we don't see fish other than maybe some daces but it, it wiped out the trout um interestingly when we were that same day when we were kind of up on the the side of the stream and, and moving around we just noticed how little leaf litter there was and just patches of, of hard compact soil in the forest and just a little bit of digging around we saw a bunch of these invasive earthworms now i'm not an earthworm guy i'm a fish guy but i couldn't tell you the scientific name but you know there is an invasive asian earthworm that's you know becoming a prod problem in the upper midwest and if you see them in the, in the forest floor, they're going to be just extremely wiggly, almost like a snake darting away from you versus our traditional night crawler we think of where they're kind of slow and whatever. Um, and these guys just eat the, the duff layer in the forest floor like it's their job and basically create a hard pack on the soil, you know, on the forest floor surface that's like concrete. Um, and, and you can just tell that, you know, not only did that area get 200 year storms in a week, the riparian ability of that, you know, the forest watershed to absorb that water just wasn't there. The water clearly just sheeted off um, with, you know, no absorption and added energy to the stream. So, you know, I, everybody has their own view on climate change and whatnot, but I certainly contend that, you know, we are seeing a lot more frequency of these hundred year storms, which should be once every hundred years by definition. And, you know, the, these short high impact amounts of rainfall and then you have this invasive species as a second part of that story. And it's changing, you know, it's changing these vulnerable habitats like headwater streams and brook trout were, you know, an unfortunate byproduct of that, um, that met their demise at Petty Bone. So Mirror Valley, this one is a stream that came out of the reintroduction as successful. And there's still a few, uh, as of 2018, there were still a few trout in there. We're gonna sample it again. This this August, and, and I suspect we're not going to find any trout, but we'll see. This is actually on the uh, Hinkley Reservation, Cleveland Metro Parks. We work with them. You know, you probably know Mike Durkalek, their biologist up there. Uh, he's a friend and great partner here in this work. Um, we were aware over time that, you know, the stream had some, some upstream land uses that needed addressed. Um, but throughout the course of the reintroduction project and, you know, the early 2010s, the stream looked like this, you know, you still see those gravel, pebble, cobble, um, you know, you see a little bit of evidence of some high energy and some bank cutting on the left there, but in generally it looks pretty intact habitat. Well, as of late, this is what uh, this stream looks like now. Um, any gravel that is there is just coated in a blanket of silt. Um, it's, it's clear that upstream uses are, are creating both higher energy, you know, higher velocity of water coming down through and eroding away and eroding that silt into the system. And this is one where, you know, Cleveland Metro Parks has identified this and put a number of, um, you know, improvement projects upstream in the watershed. And this, the lesson from this one is, you know, by the time you see the streams getting degraded and you implement restoration projects in the stream, the st stream still needs time to heal. And brook trout don't always have that time on their hands. You know, they have to get a year class off every year and at some point those adults are going to die out and that's kind of what we're seeing here you know this figure is that same abundance figure and the green is like i said or the green is the the age zeros the young and you can pretty much see starting in 2014 basically not really registering a spawn not registering your class but the maroon color the adults are still sort of hanging on 2013 14 16 and then finally, sort of the lack of reproduction caught up to it in 2018 and, and very few adults. So uh, that's why I say that this year when we go back, I would be surprised to see really any fish because you're almost getting to the point where you'd have to sort of put, you know, Harry with Sally in the same pool to have any chance of, of reproduction at this point in that stream. So that's kind of two case studies, you know, one where we, we saw issues and restoration work occurred here at Hinkley, but, you know, it needs time to heal and, and trout kind of don't have that time. And then one where I contend we saw basically the effect of climate change impacts and invasive species that decimated the other stream. Those kind of things are not things that are easily managed. 
you know, you can't manage 100 year storms at a district three fisheries management level. You can't really almost manage the earthworm at a, some sort of project scale level. These are big sort of national global type impacts that unfortunately are, are hurting these brook trout. So, you know, what does it mean moving forward? You know, we have, let me go back here. We have this picture here that shows even these five successful streams coming out of project are, are you're seeing a lot more mediums and lows as you get into 2016, 18, 19, 20. You know, what does 21, two, three, four look like for these fish? Um, you know, we're aware of that we got the brook trout committee kind of back together and was like, you know, look, we got to do something. People are asking us, what are you doing? You know, other than just monitoring it. And I agree, like, we don't want to just monitor them into their demise. Um, but it also isn't an easy management lever. It isn't like, well, I'll just raise more and stock them. Okay, we, we did that in the reintroduction project. And now we saw that even the good streams go are going downhill because of big, broad, you know, landscape scale issues. So, you know, we're kind of like, we need to go back to the drawing board. You can't just push repeat on the same notion. You know, what, how do we look at this differently to keep fish intact that we have? And that's kind of where we're at. You know, the first thing we realized, and I know you, we mentioned it even at the beginning of this talk, you know, you mentioned that how the club, maybe there's ways to partner and, you know, fiscally or whatever with brook trout. And, and that's great for sure. Um, you know, it quickly came apparent to us and was pointed out to us that before we can ever really go out there and secure like legit size grants for, you know, you know, watershed wide projects, you have to have a management plan in place. Um, you don't really even get to the, to the competitive side of those grant, uh, discussions without a management plan or a conservation plan. Um, so similar, you know, Lake Erie water snake had a recovery plan, very purposeful identified steps and strategies that then money could be paired with to hopefully sort of follow in a stepwise way to create your, your objectives. Um, not a shoot from the hip kind of like, what do we do now? Um, Spotted turtle is a great example in Northeast Ohio where lots of partners are coming together with a management plan on how do we work towards the recovery of spotted turtles. Spotted turtles is probably a great uh, analogous example to, to the brook trout. Um, and so to that end, actually, we're working with the Jaga Park District to sort of take the bones of the spotted turtle conservation plan and retool that for brook trout using that sort of structure, obviously, with different contents. And so that's where we're at now. We are in the process of working out what that plan would, would look like. Um, the goal is you know, by winter of 21, have a tangible draft in hand. Um, that, that's going to be essential, not just for securing the funding, but for even us staying consistent in our goals of what do we need to do. We know it has to be targeted. We know it has to be strategic. And then we figure out how to best partner with entities that align best with those objectives. Um, so that's kind of the phase we're in now. I mean, we will keep monitoring, obviously that's important, but we're, we're aware that monitoring in and of itself isn't the end, you know, step or goal here. Um, does it look like transplants into other streams? Maybe in a strategic way. Does it look like a big Johnny Appleseed broadcast of, of stockings again? Probably not. Um, does it look like stream restoration activities? You know, definitely maybe. Um, if they can be done in a time that allows for the stream to heal and still keep the brook trout there, we're kind of learning at the Hinkley example that that one's kind of tough. Um, so that's kind of where we're at. Uh, that's what I got on brook trout. And uh, maybe we can, let me pull up my uh, thing so I can see the participants again. Um, do we have any questions on the brook trout situation? So, so we got a, we got a couple in Kurt, um, yeah. but one that I, I'll just kind of jump to here. So, um, you know, as you talk about the plan going forward, um, and again, I know you're, you're kind of the, I think you said district three head, right. But, uh, is there any talk about introducing these, uh, uh, sort of like native Northeastern Ohio brook trout, in you know other areas of Ohio that that might be more conducive, like just in an effort to keep the, the bloodline going, as it were, you know, say say south south uh, southeast West Virginia PA area. Yeah. So thought yes. Um, to, until now, you know, to date, anyways, our stance has been keep them in the drainages we know we have historical documentation of. Um, it's just sort of that sort of 
pathway of the most conservative approach, I guess you would say, um, to not be a contributor to putting species outside the range. Now, that being said, I realize just putting them in Southeast Ohio at a water that drains into the higher river is a lot different than taking some, you know, tilapia and putting them somewhere else that's, you know, from half a world away. I, I get that. Um, but to date, we've basically held, we need to keep those in, in the drainages we know they were. Um, would that be something that maybe gets sort of looked at as you sort of flesh out what does conservation plan really look like? And, you know, what are the pros and cons of that? Um, yeah, I don't think that's out of question to consider. And, and it's, it's a valid discussion to have. Um, really until now, we've basically been of the stance of we're not really moving these fish around anyways. I mean, like when we do it, let's do it with a strategy behind it. So um, it hasn't really become a consideration yet. But you know, I have, you know, I have had have had some various requests from folks who say, "Hey, I have property in you know Belmont County or what have you, where you know it's a headwater stream and it's super cold year round. What about trout? Um, so are there some streams out there that might hold them? Yeah, possibly. Uh, awesome. Uh, thanks for that. There, there was actually a couple of other follow ups along those similar sort of lines. Um, but it, it sounds like really the answer here is, um, you know, primary, primary focus on the, the natural areas with uh, maybe a consideration of these other areas, you know, down the line is a possibility. Yeah. We've got another one in here. Um, so, so we've got a question that says, you know, maybe diving a little bit deeper into what's hurting the populations. Is it primarily water temperatures or, um, you, you know, what's really driving down these populations or, or do we not know? So I don't think we like, no, I can't say, you know, here are my statistics. I know this is it, but sort of observing what we have seen with our survey work and this, this, the way these streams have changed, I would say the number one thing we're seeing is, you know, stream, stream scouring, high, higher energy in these systems. So, you know, that's, that's going to be rain, heavier rainfalls. It's going to be landscapes that are not absorbing as much water and instead sheeting it off into the stream. Um, it could be drainage and culvert changes upstream that is, you know, kicking some sort of feeder into the stream at a, at a spot, but it definitely, the, the, the stream where we're seeing these declines, you go and you can see evidence of bank erosion at high water. You can see those twigs and leaf mass that are pushed up on the bank where at one point, you know, a big surge of water did come through. You can see where you can like slough away silt and get back down to the cobble and pebbles where, you know, that's where the brook trout would want to spawn. And it's, covered with just that sheen of silt. So um, more so than temperature, we're seeing some places where maybe it got a little warmer if there's a pond or something, but by and large, we're really not seeing actual water temperature changes. You know, it's still day to day to day to day, this water coming out of springs, but it's what's happening on the landscape that's adding sort of pulsed and periodic energy to the stream that really seems to be kind of blowing out that habitat. Got it. Uh, so, so that we, we've heard a very similar story from several of our other, um, you know, speakers over the, over the last year. Um, you know, we, we had a, a woman who came out and spoke about the, the Cuyahoga river watershed and she kind of closed her, her, uh, her presentation by saying everyone needs to have a rain garden in their yard. <laughs> so I think, I think I'm hearing the same, uh, the same statement coming from you. Everyone should be digging a rain garden. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah, it's crazy. It's kind of like, you feel like you can do nothing about it, but then maybe everybody can do a little something about it. Um, yeah. But then, you know, we, we see those earthworms, like I was saying at the Pettibone property, and that was just nuts as we got up in the forest and kind of walked around. I mean, it, the forest floor was like concrete, like rain would not absorb into it. Um, you got stuff like that. You could do all the rain barrels you want and you got a landscape, you know, a watershed scale impactor like that. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of causes at once that are kind of coming together. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, so just uh, one last, you know, current question in the, in the uh, chat box. 
um, you know, what can we do, right? We as the Trout Club, we as anglers, we as just interested parties who might be here, you know, what should we be thinking about doing? How can we help either as an organization, as an individual, you know, along those lines? How, how can we help the brook trout population? That's a great question. And, and that's what it seems like it should be easy. Like, well, here's how to help. And it's kind of the question that we always land on that I'm like, I'm not sure exactly. Um, certainly it would be things like being vocal and supportive and supporting legislation like that raw I mentioned. I mean, that's the kind of thing where you could have a $20 million infusion into Ohio for species of greatest concern. That's real money. Um, now, are there factors affecting the brook trout that's beyond a price tag? Maybe, but still that, you know, that kind of scale is, is, is some legit funding there. Um, so certainly being supportive of those type of conservation initiatives. Day to day, you know, hopefully this time next year, we do have a conservation plan that at least outlines some steps to do. Um, it may be things, you know, when I met with Steve Madewell and Terry Harmon, we kind of talked about, hey, you know, there's an aspect of this that even if we can't make every stream naturally reproducing in sort of my ideological world of, of conservation, maybe there's ways the partners can, can kind of jump on board on more of the education side where we have them in some streams that we have to put them in occasionally just so people can see them and, and learn about the history or, um, you know, maybe other sort of community engagement, education things that clubs could jump onto for sort of the awareness of it, kind of, um, you know, the bald eagle of fish, if you will. So there's, there's you know, some aspects of that that could come along. Um, you know, there may be, we were kind of talking about artificial propagation and, you know, because some of the history there, you know, Terry and the University Schools almost had an in-stream way of propagating trout. And, you know, I kind of said, well, gosh, you know, from a conservation standpoint, like to me, success is here's a stream and they're just naturally doing their thing. And they were like, yes, but maybe there's also a few places where it just is what it is that we help them along with your glasses for the continuance of the species and, and people to see. And, you know, maybe that's a way where partners like certain clubs maintain those little, you know, in-stream spawning box type things. So, you know, there, there could be some tangible ways, even when George Klein and I were talking this winter, you know, he asked what about even just those like red boxes, you, you know, you build a square out of wood and put it in gravel just so the fish have a substrate to spawn in. Um, you know, could that be something that may or may not move the needle, but it's very doable by a group of volunteers on a Saturday and maybe it adds something to the population. So I think it's a range from supporting those big federal level conservation initiatives that, you know, legislatively that could come down as well as maybe we do some small scale habitat stuff that if nothing else raises awareness among those who help out on a project and then maybe does, you know, put some band-aids on populations. So um, it's not a terribly fulfilling answer, I guess, but yeah. I'm not at the point where I say, hey, we had this project. If we only had $5,000, we do this project, but we don't. You know, that's kind of not where brook trout is, are right now um, with those sort of easy, biteable projects ready to, you know, move their. Sure, sure. Make, makes sense. And, you know, good to hear that there's, you know, perhaps some, some stuff like that maybe on the horizon, but uh you know, uh, I, I've gotten notes from, from Kendrick. I've gotten notes from, from Jerry. I mean, we as a trout club are, are here to help in, in these sort of things. So, so we want to be involved in this and, um, will in whatever capacity we can. So, um, you know, keep us in mind as, as projects do come up and, you know, we will do what we can to get the, the word out about this, like I said, like, like Jerry said at the outset, you know, this will go on our YouTube channel um, this week. So hopefully other people can see it and hear the, hear the brook trout story and, and just, you know, we can help uh, hopefully further the education aspect of it. But yeah, I, I really appreciate that. I mean, I, I do realize and, and acknowledge your, your support and desire for support. You know, when I talk to, you know, other groups or, or even internally kind of, keeping the brook trout on our internal radar, 
um, I regularly mentioned the museum's trout club and, and sort of the, the interest of support and sort of, uh, you know, at the ready for support that you guys have articulated. So uh, it doesn't, it's not falling on deaf ears. I, unfortunately, I just, I don't want to come for an ask if I don't have a good use for the ask yet, you know? Um, so hopefully we get, we get to that point. Um, but I appreciate that, that support for sure. You know, sometimes, sometimes you sit back in frustration and feel like this whole brook trout in the shadows of Cleveland is like a square peg round hole thing. Cause it's just a, such a pristine fish and such an impacted landscape. Um, but yeah, I'm not giving up, but it's definitely a, this one's a bit of a head scratcher to how you're going to keep it going intact. So. Sure, sure. Kurt, I do think the plan is helpful from a conservation perspective too. I mean, I, I know um, through some of my work that when we have plans for, you know, the Massasauga rattlesnake at the Land Conservancy or other species, you mentioned the spotted turtle and the cameras, all that. I mean, that makes a big difference for funders as well. So, yeah. you know, it just makes those projects that have the headwater streams, that have the habitat, uh, it makes them way more competitive if there's a larger plan with all those partners that you mentioned before between the NGOs, uh, the clubs and, and the state. Um, so I, I do, I have seen some of those be, be effective if they're, um, you know, done the right way. Yeah. So that, that's good. Yeah. It's not a satisfying answer when you tell somebody, well, what are you going to do? Oh, we're going to, we're going to sit there, write a plan, but it's, it's needed. I think. Yeah. For the nuts and bolts of how that works, it, it is needed. Yep. Well, we just we just got another uh, <clears throat> we just got another question coming through the chat box. Uh, somebody's actually asking, you know, is there anything that can be done about those invasive worms? So I don't know um, if you could if you could find an expert on them. <laughs> let me know because I'll sit in on the talk as well to learn. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I will say I know Paul Pierre over at Jaga Park District, and I think also in Holden. They've done some some work now. I don't know if it was anything beyond just sort of a survey. You know, what's the extent and the impact, or you know, they also have some sort of solutions or mechanisms of control. Um, but I know both of those entities do have them on their radar as you know a thing, a concern. Um, but yeah, I, I tell you, I don't know much about them beyond what I I mentioned about their impacts on the soil. Um, Got it. We'll, we'll, and we'll, and we'll I don't hear it away. much. We'll, I don't we'll even hear it much in circles. So people aren't talking about it much. But yeah, squirrel that one away as a possibility. Well, I'll open it up to anyone else who's on the call. Are there any final questions before we close it out today? Kurt, this is George Klein. Yeah. Yeah. Would there not be a, a reason to? take a few of these brook trout and put them into some type of hatchery and hold them there until uh, we don't wake up someday and find out that all the streams have been wiped out? So you could, I mean, I guess like any of this, I don't want to be black and white and say, you know, no, no way. Um, you'd have the very real pressures of, well, why are we holding these? And, and, keeping them healthy and, you know, what's the end goal here? Um, you know, I guess it'd be essentially like a living repository of the genetic material, if you will. Um, you, you'd have, you'd have some number issues too, right? Like how many do you really need to hold? So you don't have such an insane genetic bottleneck that you're not really even effectively holding the genetic diversity the population has. Um, so I, I think maybe just where rubber meets the road, it hasn't elevated to sort of a practical task to actually say we're going to put dollars and man hours at this. Um, I, I would think you'd probably be grabbing a pretty hefty number of fish if you really try to explore the kind of genetic diversity you'd want to save there. Um, and then do you swap them out or do you just keep crossbreeding those there'll be a lot of thoughts there i mean you essentially you'd be creating a hatchery strain just like we have hatchery strains now that we know pretty much all of our identified brook trout hatchery strains are genetically constricted compared to wild populations um and so does that really get you any further ahead than just saying 
we know we have hatchery brook trout strains that we could buy. I mean, the uniqueness of the Ohio strain is its diversity and, and sort of genetic differences among its nearest neighbors. Otherwise, let's not bother calling it really Ohio native brook trout and just say, well, if they go by the wayside, we go and grab some other brook trout. Um, but those are, I guess, some initial thoughts that kind of come to my mind. It'd be some of those genetic concerns and sort of what's the end goal there. Because, you know, anybody who runs a hatchery will tell you you're sort of one 24 hour period away from some, you know, disease risk that, that shuts them down. Um, so, I mean, I know there's been talk even about like cryogenically freezing some material just to keep the, the, the genome, if you will. Um, and, and maybe there's a place for that, you know, if it's a, a sort of a reasonable cost, put this in our back pocket, maybe it shouldn't be completely off the table, but, but no, to, to, to this point now, we haven't, realistically considered holding live fish for a what if situation. I think all of those type ideas are the, the you know, I think as this plan unfolds, one of the exercises I've heard that's very important in these conservation plans is you just throw every dart you have at the board at one point in time anyways. So you sort of thought, you know, you know, thought beyond maybe like the narrow views I have or the narrow views Sturkelec or Popier I have, and you just throw ideas out there. And so, yeah, hearing things like that, even though I have sort of my rational, why this might not work right now, are really good ideas to make sure like we think big and outside the box. So to, to that side, I certainly appreciate that comment. Well, I, I think we're kind of coming to a conclusion here. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if anyone else has anything else to say, but uh, I, I do just want to kind of reiterate, um, you know, turning back to club business, um, you know, we, we do have our uh, fly fair uh, this coming Saturday. So we'd love to have everyone come out. Um, Helen Hazen Wyman Park will be there most of the day. Um, and Kurt, you know, thank you so much for, for your presentation today. I think there was some great information here. Uh, there's a lot of gratitude expressed within the chat box. Um, so, you know, thank you for the time and knowledge. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me. I certainly appreciate it. It's a passion. It's a uh, topic I'm passionate about. So I definitely enjoy any chance I have to chat about it. Well, thanks everyone. Have a good evening and we'll, uh, we'll all do this again soon.